The sinner's way is foolish because it neglects to give God his proper place. Now, any way of life, any uh, attitude, any political philosophy, any moral philosophy or speculative philosophy, any kind of thinking that anybody does in any sphere of human thought or life, any standard of morals adopted or followed by any people, however loosely, that does not give God his proper place is declared by the Lord God himself to be foolish and empty. And that is what's wrong with us in our time. Foolish way of life. People around us are foolish. The men who went out and got themselves pepped up during the holiday and then the next day suffered with big heads, they weren't so bad as they were just foolish. It's foolish to treat your body like that. It's foolish. They were doing a, a morally foolish thing because they did not take God into that consideration. Some of us, in our efforts at evangelism, try to make sinners out of everybody in the sense that we make everybody to be vicious and low and wicked. That's not true. There are sinners who will certainly perish and spend their eternity in hell, who are nevertheless courteous, kind, friendly gentlemen. You consider it a privilege to live next door to them if you owned a little home someplace. Good neighbors, thoughtful. But they're living without a thought of God in their minds. Their way is a foolish way of life because it is a godless way of life. It's not always a morally low way of life, for there are all levels of wickedness. But it is a way that doesn't take God into consideration. The Bible says it's foolish. And Peter says that it's a foolish, illogical way to live because it ignores God and it ignores reason. And it disregards the moral lessons of history. It disregards the lessons that history teaches. History has been pictured as an old fellow with uh, uh, an old-fashioned quill pen writing lessons. Well, even though history is not always accurate, I think it was Napoleon, wasn't it, or Voltaire, that said that history was a lot of lies agreed upon. But that was a cynic's uh, statement. The truth is, there's a lot we can learn from history. And what would be one thing we can learn from history is that it's always better to be righteous. I remember when I was a very young preacher, very young. I was preaching in the state of West Virginia, up in the country. and. Uh, I hate tobacco now as much as I did then, but I have sense enough to know that it's only a pimple on the body of morality and is not itself basic, so I don't preach against tobacco, though I hate it. But those days I did. That is, I attacked anything I thought it didn't look good, and uh, tobacco was one. And I used to really tell them that they were dirty if they used it and couldn't be Christians. And do you know... Do you know the response to that kind of preaching? It was this, white-faced anger. Do you mean to tell me that my old father who smoked and chewed until he died and my grandmother who was a Christian and chewed smoked a clay pipe and she died, you mean to tell me that they perished? They were sanctifying the ways of their parents. And they were on the cool end of a hot stick uh, that is smoking, because it, they, I suppose they liked the taste of it, and because it was received by tradition from their fathers. It was sanctified by generation after generation of incense burning. And uh, they didn't want me to say a word about it. Not for their sakes, but because it seemed to be reflecting on the tradition of their fathers. Well, I've learned better, that's only one more thing, and I preach Christ. God has provided a moral release from the tradition of our fathers, the foolish way of life that we see all around about us. And it's been done by an act of God in redemption, involving the payment of a ransom for its moral, not a physical captivity, though it has physical implications for sinners, but it, is a, it has its legal and moral aspects. Well, the ransom price had to be the moral ransom price. It had to be the blood of the Holy One, holy enough for God to accept. So that moral price was paid. It says it was not silver nor gold. I were a 
slave in a market somewhere in Arabia or in the old south. Now we're worth $200 to $500, depending upon my age and size and ability. Someone might come with a pocket full of gold and buy me, and then set me free. But free with money, silver and gold. But when your bondage is not physical but moral, you can't buy off moral slaves with money. So Peter says you were redeemed not with silver nor gold, but with precious blood. Brethren, we are free this morning, if we are free, by blood most precious.